Get ready to be inspired by the great things happening in rural education. The Rural Scoop will bring you new ideas and innovative solutions. We'll dive into education issues and we'll highlight what's working in your rural communities. You will hear from a variety of educators, administrators, professionals, and others who will provide relevant and engaging content in each episode. And now, serving up the scoop, here's your host, Dr. Melissa Seydorf. Well, I'm so glad that you could join us, Rural Scoop listeners, for a part of a series of interviews that focuses on our Teachers of the Year from across the country. And it's really exciting to be able to highlight the fantastic things that are happening in rural classrooms all across the country. Um, I have the privilege of working with my co-host, Ty White, for this series. Ty has been a Teacher of the Year here in Arizona for the Arizona Rural Schools Association. He was last year's National Education Association Teacher of the Year. And he was also here in Arizona, the Teacher of the Year for the Arizona Education Foundation. And so with all of that, uh, he's... He's been recognized for some of the amazing work that he's doing here in Arizona, and it's fun to be able to have him with me as we highlight things that are happening outside of our state. So, Ty, please introduce yourself. All right. So, my name is Ty White. I teach high school math. I'm sorry. I teach high school chemistry. You do now. <laughs> yeah, I do now. I teach Algebra 1 now as well. Um Hey, so this one will actually be out, and I was the national runner-up for Air and Space Force Association this year. Whoop, whoop. Nice Congrats. job. Um, I'm really excited to share with our guests today. We have our first CTE teacher with us. Yay. And so Chad is, is an ag teacher from Utah, and of all the fun things to share about him, and I'm going to let him introduce himself, but of all the fun things, because I don't want him to leave this out. Not only is Chad the Utah Teacher of the Year for 2023, but his dad was the Utah Teacher of the Year a few years ago, too. So that's Chad exciting. Been, right. <laughs> Runs in the family. <laughs> Chad, you want to go ahead and tell our listeners about yourself? Yeah, as you said, uh, I'm Chad Warnick here in Utah. I teach at a rural high school, Delta High School. And uh, it's the same high school that I actually went to school at. And I have that opportunity to uh, be back here. I'm married to another ag teacher who also teaches social studies. And we have four great kids and love life. Yes. We're at in Utah. Uh, it's Delta. So it's in the oh, central cool. portion of the state, kind of edging towards Nevada. Okay. Yeah, I guess I should have known like rural models, Delta High School would be in Delta, Utah. I thought maybe you were jazzing it up with a special Greek name or something. Well, it does mean change. And so we're hoping someday it changes, but not too fast. <laughs> so, Jack, can you tell us a little about a little bit about when you figured out you wanted to be an educator and how you went about that? Yeah, it kind of came in a way that I didn't um, anticipate. Um, you know, during my eighth grade year, ninth grade year of high school, it was a hard time for me. Uh, it was kind of that time where either friends moved away or friends made other choices, and I had a hard time finding a new friend group. And thanks to a awesome mom, she made sure I stayed involved and I didn't stay at home. And so I got involved in FFA, but I also got involved in 4-H. And those gave me opportunities to travel, to compete, and that helped me to build my self-confidence at a stage of time where I was really lacking in it. And my 4-H leader, Mike Pace, uh, did an amazing job of helping me to grow and develop. And I knew at that point I wanted to do youth development. And so after coming home from my mission in Scotland for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I went to Utah State and found the building where they went to become extension agents and 4-H leaders. And the first person I found in that building, I said, hey, I want to be a 4-H leader. And he asked me, Dr. Rudy Tarpley said, why do you want to do that? I said, I want to make the difference in the lives of students. And he said, well, if you become a 4-H leader, you'll do that. If you become an ag teacher, you'll be able to do it more and impact more kids. <laughs> and so 15 minutes later, I had a four-year plan and I've never looked back from being an ag teacher. That's pretty cool. Hmm. And so the 4-H is a 4-H. I'm sure you know them. Oh, yeah. 
I head, heart, health, and hands. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. From one 4-H uh, kid to another, I appreciate that. <laughs> it's a fantastic program. And my so, student or my, my own personal kids are still involved in it or volunteers with the 4-H and it's still an active part of our life. That's fantastic. And it means such a, a it's a big deal in a rural community where there's not a lot of access to other programming. 4-H is something, as well as FFA, is something that you're going to see in rural communities quite often. So you speaking know, speaking of that, as a teacher, you have a lot of options, especially right now with our teacher recruitment and retention issue across the country. You have a lot of options for where you choose to teach. So you're in a rural community. And talk a little bit about why you decided to stay rural. Besides the fact that you grew up there, which I know is is a big part of, of that I'm sure, decision. Well, even before I got this job, the jobs I were was applying for were rural-based. Um, I want to have that, not because being an agriculture educator is limited to only rural areas. We have it in all the large cities and communities in Utah. Um, even if you go to the extent of Chicago, Chicago, um, they have uh, agriculture education and FFA there. So it's available uh, in all those places. But at the end of the day, I'm a country kid at heart. I like to have neighbors that I talk to, and even if they live a mile away, rather than neighbors who I live next door to that kind of stick to themselves. I love the values that we find in rural communities of knowing and helping and supporting and just, you know, the beautiful um, aspects of it. Uh, I'm able to help my dad on his farm. And we do flood irrigation, and sometimes we have to go out in the middle of the night to check it. And while I'm waiting for the water to be able to look up at night and see all the stars is incredible. And if you weren't in a rural area, you know, that would probably be diminished when you go out at night. And so just the the lifestyle, um, it's hard, but I love it. I can I can completely understand that. You know, maybe one thing to add with that a little bit, um, you know, we we do miss the restaurants you find in the big cities, but we do have McDonald's and Subway. So those kind of get us through <laughs> a little bit, but They'll we'll, we'll visit the larger areas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice that we can go and visit, but then come back home. So have you always taught in Delta? I did. Uh, my wife, as I said before, uh, is a teacher. She graduated a year before I did. And unexpectedly, my high school act teacher, Mr. Eakins, uh, retired, and we were not anticipating that. And so almost half-heartedly, you know, we made the decision that maybe she should apply just for the experience. And, you know, her, she was amazing enough that they said, well, we'd like to offer you the job. And so she took the job. I stayed up at college and finished another year of school. And in that time, uh, she gave birth to our first child, and she said she wanted to stay home and be a mom. And I was lucky enough to be able to apply and get the job and uh, end up in Delta. So I've spent all 18 years teaching here. So, Chad, even though teaching rural is is what we prefer, and I understand the attraction of that, there as you there are, as you said, some challenges, uh, opportunities too. But there's some challenges that we encounter in rural school communities. Can you talk a little bit about what those challenges have looked like for you and how you might have overcome them? Yeah, a few challenges that we have in rural communities in our area, probably our furthest child who comes to our uh, school is, you know, 30 plus minute drive away. And so if a kid is not able to get things done during the school day, it's not as simple as stay after school for 20 minutes mm -hmm. and work on that, and then you can walk home. So we have to be very adaptable and creative on how we can try to help students who miss class. And one of the reasons why students miss class maybe more frequently in a rural area is because they travel to be involved in sports and other activities. And so we have students travel. Our close travel is an hour away, and we have multiple that are pushing three hours away to get to travel. Our freshman football team got home last night at 11.30 at night, <laughs> and I had them in class at 8.18 this morning, and we were taking a test. And they just, you could tell that they were not 100%. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we, we developed a plan on, you know, do your best today and then let's strategize on what we can do to make sure that on a different day, you can give us your best. And so time and distance are um, struggles that we have to work with our students uh, all the time to be able to meet. Uh, another nice thing about a rural area, sometimes maybe we have um, our housing might be cheaper than large and urban areas. But what we find that sometimes we have people moving here because it is cheaper, but that they don't have um, some of the financial means that you find in a suburban area. And so being able to have kids be involved and be having the financial supports um, to be able to be involved um, are challenges that we have. Uh, when I tell my students that want to be involved in the FFA program, the only reason not to participate is because you don't want to. Mm-hmm. But money should not be that reason. So we have amazing people in the community that if there is a need, people will step up and help. And so that sense of community helps us address the challenges that come with that uh, financial challenge that comes with so many um, kids in these areas. Uh, another challenge that we have in this area is, you know, with agriculture, we tend to see somewhat of either an uh, um, immigrant population that comes in. And with that, you know, there's sometimes language barriers that have to be overcome. And so those are um, wonderful individuals that we get the opportunity to see their uh, linguistically gifted opportunity to, for them to learn a second language. And we get to be a part of that and try to help them develop the content in the process. So all these are challenges, but you know, if anything's a challenge, then there's usually a a reward at the end. I think all these happen. Absolutely. So one of the issues that comes up, and I think this is really going to be a good question for you, Chad. One of the issues that comes up in rural communities is that teachers have to wear multiple hats and take on different roles. So we're curious about, I'm curious, especially about some of those crazy things you've done. How long is the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> as long as we want it to be. <laughs> there you do. You wear many, many hats um, in a rural community. And, you know, just to name some, uh, you know, my my own children is there involved in different activities, you know, trying to be a volunteer or a parent coach in their little league days. Uh, I teach hunter safety um, to the community because there's a need for that. A lot of kids want to do it. We haven't had a lot of instructors as I mentioned, we're really active um, in the 4-H with our children. So we support the stock show as well as the clubs and the family clubs. Uh, my son that's in high school, he likes to wrestle. And so I provide the audio visual for them as they go to different tournaments. Uh, I'm involved in my church, uh, volunteering with the youth programs that are there. I help with our county fair. Um, there's just so many different opportunities to be involved in the community. And that's one of the best things because that's how you create relationships with a diverse group of people. That's how you um, network with individuals. And what's great about all of those is that creates an opportunity for me to share a little bit about the story of my students. And as they hear about the opportunities that they have, as well as the needs they have, um, that has led to you know building some community relationships with our students that I wouldn't have been able to foster any other way. You know, and it's just great modeling for civic engagement and going beyond the the expectations to really work together in a team, in a community, in a school. And a big thing I tell my students all the time is, you know, seek out opportunities to serve, seek out opportunities to lead, and seek out opportunities to speak. And if I'm going to invite my students to do those things, by golly, I better do it. And so I, it's been a great experience to be able to have them see me in those uh, roles. And then when I come to class, I can say, see, I'm doing it. Now you have to go do it. Let's take a short break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Trainual for sponsoring The Rural Scoop. Trainual is the number one software for process documentation and employee manuals. It puts everything into one simple searchable system that is easy to navigate, is clearly organized, and is simple to access. It's perfect for schools and even entire school systems. Trainual can also help your continuation plans as well. For example, your chemistry teacher can log how they've organized the storage room, making it easier for the next person who takes that job. 
Listeners of the Rural Scoop get 10% off their first 12 months by using offer code Rural Scoop. When you sign up for your free trial, just enter Rural Scoop, one word, as a promo code, and it'll automatically apply. Just go to trainual.com to get started. So, Chad, one of the things Ty and I talk a lot about is the rural advantage. And it means different things to different people. And I'm really interested to hear what does the term rural advantage mean to you? And what are those opportunities that lend themselves to that rural advantages as a teacher working in a rural community? We'll start by sharing a story about a friend of mine who I met my freshman year in college. She went to a large school, one of the largest in the state of Utah. And when she went to college, she met someone. And as she was talking to this young man, she found out that not only did they go to the same high school together, they graduated in the same class and never had met before. And so to me, a rural advantage is the fact that we tend to have smaller schools and it's easier for us to know who's there and easier for kids not to get as lost in the process because we know who they are. We know who their parents are and we have the opportunity to be able to kind of keep a, an eye on them and be able to track them. So I think that's one rural advantage that we have that we can share with um, our community and with our students. Other advantages that I think that we can uh, consider with the rural community, I uh, kind of alluded to this before, is just there's just so many opportunities to have the community. The high school becomes kind of the hub of the community. And, you know, that's where we go almost for entertainment. But there's so much support. Uh, individuals want to know what's going on. When you put something in the local paper or on social media about your uh, students, People love to see that and be connected. After this podcast, I'm headed into a, a vehicle and heading up to the high school football game uh, an hour and a half away. And <laughs> there's going to be a ton of people from our community that travel and support. So the community is vested in what happens in our schools. And I think all those things are examples. I went to my niece's volleyball game one time that was in a suburban area. And they had, and the school they played was only, you know, 10 minutes away from them. And they had probably less than 30 people in attendance wow. at the game. And at our volleyball game last night, you know, there is hundreds, four or 500 people that are there. And so I think that really being a rural community draws the community together around the school and they want to see them support because they know those kids, they know their families. And ultimately, we want those kids well-prepared to come back and live in our communities because that's usually who wants to be in rural communities or those who come from them. And so we need to make sure that we are investing in our future and we almost in a way know who's going to come back and live here. And that's maybe why we're more vested in them. You know, that, that brings to mind two things, Chad. The first is the school truly is the hub of a rural community. And whether it's things that are happening for sports or a play or parent teacher night it really is the place that draws the community together it's that it's that sweet spot so to speak where you can have the community come together and gather and then the other thing that you're talking about is also very important in a rural community is that workforce development aspect because if we're training students to potentially as a teacher i'm sure you're very aware that those those students that graduate with certificates that they can put into the workforce right away, now you have a workforce development issue that you're able to address with local homegrown citizens that are now taking jobs within your community and staying, like you said. Yeah, for sure. That's a big emphasis that we have in CTE is making sure that we are being relevant to our local industries. And we're currently partnering with our local college, which uh, is about 90 miles away, to make sure we have a path for students that are industry-based. And so it starts in the high school where they get specific skills that then can transfer into certificates, which can transfer into associate's degrees, into degrees, 
of a bachelor or higher nature based off the input of our local industries. So I have the opportunity to sit on industry panels with agriculture, and we're always assessing what are the needs that you have, what's coming down the road, and then how do we adjust what we're teaching to make sure that we're preparing you with a skilled workforce that is ready to hit the ground running as much as possible. And so we're making sure we do the technical skills that they need, but even to a larger aspect, we're trying to teach them those skills that are harder for people to leave high school with because they're not getting them the same way that they used to, um, maybe because there's too much technology. So we're trying to make sure that they can have the skills of cooperation, creativity, uh, and critical thinking, communication, those 20 first century skills that are often talked about, but then maybe are not intentionally placed into a classroom setting to make sure that we are addressing them so that we really are the answers that the industry needs in preparing Mm. their next generation of workers. You know, I think both of those, the way you said it the first time about communities being connected to you and the way you and Dr. Sador both couched it in community needs and jobs and that we're keeping our people connected to our communities. I've always just sort of seen it as an emotional tie, but I, like the, I think you've got a better justification for it. When I got to speak at Green Bay last year, I thought a big part of my story was that every person who's graduated from Globe walks through the same building. It's been remodeled, it's been redesigned, it's been grown, but it's always been the same building. And, and just that part of being rooted in an area gives you that connection to the history but I can absolutely see what you guys are getting at with the industrial factors and the, the jobs and what keeps people in a place. Chad, you've already had this question before. <laughs> when me and Melissa were coming up with these questions for you guys, I thought, oh, every interview I've done has asked this, and I want to hear your guys' answers. What would be like your proudest moment as a teacher or that aha moment that really said, this is what I was meant to do? You know, I think you almost answered it with the question. It's when students have those aha moments. It's when those students who you see as freshmen, they come in lacking confidence. They don't understand the relevance of what you're teaching. And then they leave with decisive skills that they know that they can immediately go out and use. And those are best shared, you know, maybe not even at graduation or during the school year. But, you know, a few years later, when someone sends you a text message and say, hey, by the way, what you did, what you shared, what you taught is impacting me and being able to just be proud of what each and every one of my students have done. Uh, That's what I love so much about social media in a way that we're able to see the success of our students that maybe our teachers did not get to see us have unless we came back to our communities because I'm just proud of what they do. You know, whether they, you know, have their first child or whether they um, get to go on a fun adventure that they've always wanted to do or whether they just find their passion for what they want to do for a job. Or if it's nothing else that they just are going through a job that maybe they don't love, but they're working hard and taking care of their family. So I just am proud of my students. And so when you ask me what I'm proud of, I'm proud of my students. And it's it's so easy to want to stay in education when you have the relationships with students. And I think as a rural teacher in a high school setting, that is even a stronger thing because most of the students I have, I don't have them for a year. I have them for four years. Mm -hmm. And some of them, I don't have them once a a year. I have them two times or three times a year for three or four years and really get to know them and feel like the impact is really strong with them of what I'm able to contribute. So Chad, you're really already answering my question, (laughs) but I'd like you to continue in that vein and talk about what teachers that are considering where they're going to teach, why should they look at a rural setting as a very good option for where they might want to land? When I consider why teachers should consider rural areas, what I think is a wonderful reason is the investment that the community and parents have in it. 
you are able to develop those relationships with the students and with their parents. And, you know, I don't ever kick a kid's butt, but I'll, if they do something like, Hey, your parent said I could kick your butt. You know that, right? They're like, yeah, I know. And you just really know who they are and who they're connected to. And that doesn't mean that everything's perfect. Um, you know, when you live in a small rural community, um, the closeness means that everyone knows everything. But I think that's also what's valuable. And it's just a great way to live, uh, you know, being able to not face traffic, you know, maybe getting stuck behind a combine is your traffic jam for the day. I'll handle that over stop and go. Um, knowing that people know who you are and they want to ask you about your classroom, I think that's valuable. And it's just, I don't know, for me, it's home. You know, I'm in my actual hometown. But when I looked at other communities before I got this job, that was a big thing. You know, is this a place that we want to raise our families? Yeah, that's a big reason to live in a rural community. It's still a great way to raise kids. And, you know, for my kids, you know, that's chasing animals or um, going out and messing around on old farm equipment and just having adventures without having to be stuck inside a home on technology. So I would recommend rural um teaching not just to those who come from a rural area, but for anyone who you know wants to get back to a connectedness with community and outdoors and all those great things. So, Chad, I saw as a fellow state teacher of the year <laughs> that you took a picture, you, you shared with everybody that little placard that Do- Dr. Jill Biden sent out to us. I'm curious, at the bottom of yours, what did you really talk about being optimistic about this year? What are you looking forward to? Hey, the three things that I put down is number one, I teach the best students. Um, you know, and if I taught in a different school, I would truly believe that I teach the best students there. And you have to believe that about your kids. Uh, another I thing. I know you just justified it. And I know I'm not supposed to cut you off, but I teach the best kids. So you're going to have to read that. <laughs> I think we all teach the best kids. <laughs> I'm not saying that um, my kids are better than yours, but I definitely know that they're not worse than yours. So we can have <laughs> equally best. Uh, the next thing I put down is utilizing innovative teaching tools. There are so many great tools and technologies and strategies that are always evolving within education and it's especially important where as students are involving that we keep up with them to keep them engaged in what we're doing and the third the reason why i'm optimistic about this year is uh, the building of relationships with the students that i have right now and i think about the seniors who left last year and when they came on day one as a freshman i didn't know who they would be or what they would be like and now i have a new batch of freshmen and it's exciting to think about the potential that they have and not knowing who they're going to be or how they're going to get there, but it's going to be a great journey no matter what. So Chad, is there anything else as we wrap up our conversation that you want to make sure that we highlight or recognize? Well, since I am the first career technical education teacher (laughs) on this podcast, just the opportunity to highlight the value that the CTE classes have for all students, not just those who are in uh, headed towards a trade skill. When I was doing my master's project, I researched the impact that CTE classes had on college. And what we found is that students who participated in CTE, one, were admitted at higher rates to college, they were retained at higher rates of college and they graduated at higher rates in college than those who didn't have CTE. And the more CTE classes they took, the higher those percentages went up. And as I, I didn't go into the data with that particular study to figure out the reason why, but I think there's a couple of reasons. When students are involved in CTE, whether it's a wood shop, welding class, or all the various things, there's a lot of problem solving that needs to happen. And so as they develop those problem solving skills, that better prepares them to handle those difficult times that may become in college. The second thing is I think they leave with a trade or a skill that's marketable, and that can help them to be able to have a job where they can maybe get a little better pay. And so they're not having to leave schooling in order to uh, seek out employment to just take care of life. 
Now, on the flip side, college has its place for many students, but just going into the trades, whether it's a trade school or straight into industry, taking these tech classes are so amazing to give them those skills that make them industry ready. And the last reason why I think it's valuable is it can save someone thousands and thousands of dollars over the life by just knowing how to do things, being able to do basic electrical, knowing how to do some carpentry, knowing how to do interior design, knowing how to do floral arrangements or all those type of skills, whatever the kid finds an interest in, that is something that they'll take and maybe develop a passion or a hobby that they can follow. So college classes are great, but make sure we balance them with some great CTE classes that high schools have to offer. Good list. And I'll add mechanic so yeah. that you know how to take care of your vehicle. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying we need to add a fifth year of high school to get all the tech classes in, but it would be worth the while to make sure that if you took every tech class available, you'd never regret any of them. That's fantastic. So one thing that we've been really blessed with here at our school goes back to my very first year of teaching in which when I was teaching an animal science class about early springtime, we were watching a video and it was a really old VHS video and a student in absolute frustration said, Mr. Warnick, are we ever going to do anything with animals? And I really had to think about that. And I immediately thought about my dad who had been a teacher and he was a woodshop teacher. And I wondered what would have woodshop been if we never did anything with wood? We just learned about it. If we just watched videos, we just did chapters out of the book. It would have been kind of a meaningless class. And so I stopped the video right then. We had a discussion about what they wanted to do. Well, that led to the next day going to some property next to the high school that the school district had purchased. And we walked up there. It was nothing but some old dilapidated buildings and some weeds. And I said, what do you guys want to do? And so they spent the class period walking around, writing notes, and then they came back to the class and they spent the next week or two creating plans, deciding what animals they wanted to do. They broke up into groups and then they did class presentations on different species. Well, after it was all done, they voted, decided that they wanted to raise pigs. So they worked on that plan, put it together, went to the school board and said, we want to raise pigs and will you give us some money to get started? And so they asked for twice the amount of money that they needed because we were afraid that they wouldn't give us any or they'd cut it in half. And after kids presented to the school board, they said, yeah, absolutely. And they gave us what we asked for. And so that began our school farm. And so we went up and we put in uh, what would become our pig facility. But even before we had the pig facility done, we just bought four panels and bought some pigs and threw them in there so we could start right away raising these animals. And since that time, we have added to it um, different species. And once we started doing this, people pulled in with their vehicles and said, hey, what's happening here? And they saw it and the community saw it. And then we had kids raising animals for the fair. We had little brothers coming. And now it's become somewhat of a community hub. And the community has come in and has really helped us develop that. We've had people donate heavy equipment to fix things. We've had people come in and repair and build items. We've had people come in to haul gravel and donations and time, money, and effort. And now this last year, we have a dairy cattle building that we do heifers. We have our pig building. We have our goat building. We have our overflow building. We've had different other species. At times, we've done chickens. We had one year, we did a wild horse and wild burrow that we got from the BLM that the students trained. We have a pheasant facility that we have um, built that we'll put into use next year. We put the well connection in to start an orchard with our plant science class. And so we've really turned this class that was kind of book-based, um, theory-based into hands-on skill-based to where one, we do it in class, but then two, if someone wants to have an experience that's not directly related to class, they now have a place to raise an animal. And even in a rural community, not everyone has a place that they can throw a pig in their backyard. But now we have this as a resource for students from kindergarten all the way up to high school. If they want to have an agriculture experience, there's a place that they can do it. Wow. That's not only tapping into your community's assets, that's becoming a community asset. That's phenomenal. And it's kind of led to what's become our philosophy, which is 
we do these three things. Delta FFA is a place where we raise livestock, we grow crops, and we cultivate leaders. Mm -hmm. And we don't have kids raise animals and plants. We have animals and plants that are used to help raise kids. Well said. All I'm going to say is, Dr. Sadorf, you've been a superintendent, you've been a principal. I challenge you to find me a better example of a teacher having student-led and student-driven innovations on campus. I I don't know if I've seen one. I'm going to have to come visit, Chad. <laughs> you're, you're always welcome. <laughs> it sounds like a fantastic uh, opportunity to uh, present your students with. I'm glad that they have that for your programming. That's fantastic. Well, thank you. Well, as we wrap up, Ty, any last words that you want to say? No, I, uh, Chad, I'm very glad we could have you here. I, I think the stories and the things I've seen you doing on, on social media, I think the stories I've gotten to listen from you when we meet in person, like I'm, I'm glad you got to join us. Yeah, glad that you were able to make it. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to The Rural Scoop. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe, or even leave us a comment. And be sure to follow on Twitter at Dr. Sadorf. That's D-R underscore S-A-D-O-R-F so that you never miss a new release. You can also check out previous episodes of The Scoop wherever you get your podcasts. Production support for The Rural Scoop is provided by Chattanooga Podcast Studios. Find out more at ChattanoogaPodcastStudios.com. See you next time for more great discussions about rural education.